Amen. All right, keep your place in Matthew chapter 6. So this evening in uh, the Baptist Basic Series, we're continuing that. We're going to talk about the topic of fasting. We're going to talk about the topic of fasting. I don't know that I've actually heard a lot of, of sermons or maybe, uh, you know, any full sermons at all on fasting, but fasting is definitely mentioned in the Bible many times, and it's a tool that we have that we can use, and many people in the Bible, we can't even, there's so many places in the Bible where people fasted, we can't even go through all the places in the Bible that talks about fasting. So I want to explore this idea of fasting this evening, do a little bit of a Bible study on, on the what, the why, the how of fasting, and you know, what it, what it means. So look down at Matthew chapter 6, and look at verse number 16. The Bible says, Moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, and that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head, and wash thy face, that thou, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward the openly. So let's look at this idea of fasting this evening, see what it is, how we do it, and uh, what it means. First of all, um, before I get into fasting, I want to just give a little bit of, uh, you know, the Bible actually has a lot to say about food in general. You know, the Bible has a lot to say on eating, on um, eating food, when you should eat, what you should eat, all these types of things. Like the Bible covers everything in our lives. And I want to just look at a couple Bible verses on eating and food, and that'll kind of help us understand, you know, this idea of fasting a little bit more. Turn to Proverbs chapter 23. So before we get to the topic of fasting, and we look at what fasting is, why uh, people did it in the Bible, should we do it now, um, and, and how to do it if we should do it. Let's look at that this evening, but let's look at, at food first. Look at Proverbs chapter 23. In verse number 2, the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 23 and verse number 2, it says, I mean, I love this verse here. The Bible says, and put a knife to thy throat, if thou be give a man given to appetite. So, I mean, the Bible here is saying he's, first of all, I mean, this is the problem today. Or not, Okay, I shouldn't even say it's the problem today. We have plenty of problems, okay? But this is a big problem today, especially in a country like ours where we're just, we're blessed with so much abundance you know, the, there's, 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 not, not, you know, there's not really a lack of food out there. You know, this is why a lot of Americans are so unhealthy, that they're just, you know, they're unhealthy. You know, the Bible here is saying, though, it's, it's such a serious thing. It's like, put a knife to your throat if you can't stop eating. Do anything you need to do, it's basically saying, to stop eating too much. Turn to Proverbs chapter 25, just a couple chapters over. The Bible even speaks against eating too much sugar. I mean, imagine the specifics of that. And look, you know, like it's birthday night, so it's like once a month. We actually, we're doing birthday nights like every single night of church when we first started. And we're just going to do it once a month because, you know, we want to have, you know, some control over, you know, the desserts in, in our lives, right? So have a piece of cake tonight, okay? Don't let this sermon, like, ruin your evening and your, your day tomorrow. Proverbs 25, look at verse 16. The Bible says, Hast thou found honey? And it says, Eat so much as is sufficient for thee, lest thou be filled therewith and vomit it. You know, so the Bible here is, it's not saying that, that honey's bad. It's not saying that sugar's bad. It's just saying that if you eat too much, it will literally make you sick. All right? And I, look, I got a funny story here. So I, I was out fishing. I was camping with Garrett when he was like, I have his permission to tell this story. So I was camping with Garrett. He was like five or six years old. I think you were five or six, right? Pretty young. And we were out and we were paddle fishing. I don't know if you know what paddle fishing is, but you basically, it's where the, there's a spot in North Dakota on the Montana, North Dakota border where the Yellowstone River and the Missouri River, they converge, they come together. And during a certain time of year, paddle fish run up the river and they congregate in the convergence of these two, of these two rivers where the rivers converge, okay? Now, the way you fish for paddlefish is totally stupid. It's not even a sport. Is you put a like a big lead weight on a on a drop 
leader and with, a, with a big treble hook like this big, about six inches up from the lead weight, and you just throw this thing across the river again and again and again, and you just rip this hook with this weight through the river. By the time I would be done paddle fishing, I would have bruises on both sides of my ribs from just ripping this weight and this treble hook through the water. I've never caught a paddle fish in my life. And I've gone like three years in a row. And I'd be standing next to my sister, who is half my size, and she's catching 120 pound paddlefish every single year. She casts half as far and, and, and half as many times as I do. I've never caught one. It's the most frustrating thing ever. I don't even like talking about it. But anyway, the second year I went, Garrett was with me. We were camping out, and I was catching, I was determined to catch a paddlefish. Okay? So I put Garrett on the bank on the river and I'm out standing in the river paddle fishing and he's, he's a little kid and I'm just like, all right, I gave him a, 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 a bag of licorice and like a bag of Cheetos and I'm just like, here, here you go. You know, and I went out and I paddle fished around. It could have been that long, maybe an hour. And I wasn't paying a lot of attention to him, but he just sat there with this bag of, of Cheetos and bag of licorice the whole time I was out in the river fishing and I turned around to come out of the river and he's just, covered in, in vomit, you know? He, he just, he just, and I'm like, oh, I'm the worst dad ever, you know? It's like one of those moments, you know, because he just, he just sat there and just, he just indulged in, in too much honey, right? He Proverbs 25, 16 himself, right? And I let him do it. So the Bible here is saying, you know, control your sugar intake. Don't eat too much sugar. Okay, turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 10. The Bible even tells you, you know, when you should eat and why you should eat, the Bible says. So, I mean, the Bible tells us, you know, to not eat too much. The Bible tells us to not be a glutton. The Bible tells us, you know, not to eat too much sugar. The Bible tells us when we should eat and for what reasons we should eat. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse number 16. So don't sit down and just eat like a whole bag of Cheetos and, and top it off with a bag of licorice. All right? Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse number 16. The Bible says, Woe to thee, O land, when thy king is a child and thy princes eat in the morning. Blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the son of nobles and thy princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. So the Bible here is saying, look, when, when you have these princes that are just eating in the morning, is like, that, you know, woe to that land. When you have leaders that are just, you know, they're just eating to eat for pleasure is basically what's going on here. The Bible says, and it says in the morning, because in the morning nobody's done any work in the morning. And in verse 17, it says uh, it's a good land or, you know, it's a blessed land when the princes eat in due season. That means they eat after they've, they've done work, after they've done something. Okay, and why? For strength. They eat for strength and not for drunkenness. Look, you should eat for strength after you've worked. This is talking about how eating should go together with physical activity or physical exercise. This is why you eat. But look, you can train your body to just eat all the time. You can train your body to be hungry all the time. Last year at work, this lady started bringing in this big bowl of candy into work. And you know, I don't know, for whatever reason, at 2 o'clock every single day, I went and just grabbed a bunch of uh, these little mini candy bars. And those are worse than candy bars because you don't know how many you're eating. And, you know, you eat. And look, you, you can train yourself. And then I would just crave that. At 2 o'clock every day, I would just start to crave that, those candy bars. Look, you can train your body to, to eat, like, all the time. To be hungry all the time. We'll, we'll talk more on this later. But look, just, I mean, just on a, on a personal note, you know, as I get older, I, I have found that the best way, look, I exercise. Look, I exercise. I work out on a regular basis. By the way, homeschooling. We're, we're homeschooling. We're a homeschooling church here. You know, exercise and training your kids how to exercise should be part of your homeschooling curriculum. Okay, the Bible talks about it. Um, eating properly and exercising. You know, the public school has PE class. The public school has organized sports. You say, we play sports here, we do physical activities here, but look, you should train your kids, teach your kids how to have a regular exercise program. 
our kids are required, and, and we, after you require it for a while, they start to like it and it becomes a lifestyle for them. But they exercise, and we provide ways for them to exercise so many times a week, every single week. It's a lifestyle. And that's how, that's how your homeschooling curriculum should be. You should have that in there. Okay, don't leave any gaps in your homeschooling curriculum. But look, the, the, the personally, I have found I exercise and, and you know, I try to stay active and exercise is great, it's important, okay? But the only real way that I have found to lose weight or to maintain weight is to stop eating. It is that simple. I, you know, during the week, and you say, well, you, you know, weekends I give myself a break, okay? But during the week, I eat once a day. I eat once a day. I do not eat breakfast and I do not eat lunch. And you know what? You can train your body to do that. I don't even get hungry at lunch anymore. I don't even get hungry at lunch. And look, you can also stop your sugar intake and stop that craving for sugar. The first few days not going to that candy jar at 2 o'clock was rough. But after that, your body will, will come off of it. Your body will, you know, and look, and then you will just have immediate weight loss when you start doing this. You know, so look, I mean, another problem today is, is just lack of physical activity on top of all this eating. Think of the men in the Bible. Think of the people in the Bible. Think of the disciples. They were walking everywhere. I mean, they were walking everywhere, constant exercise. Think of just Joshua we talked about on Wednesday. I mean, he's, he's constantly fighting. He's constantly serving. I mean, but look, the, the one thing that makes the difference for me personally, if I want to lose weight, is eating. Eat less, lose weight. Eat more, gain weight. It's an energy balance. It's very simple. Okay? Now, the Bible talks about eating. That's just a little primer. Let's talk about fasting. Let's talk about biblical, spiritual fasting. And then we'll tie these two thoughts together. Turn to Psalm chapter 35. Fasting. So fasting is, I mean, it's all over the Bible. It's all over the Bible in the New Testament. It's all over the Bible in the Old Testament. People are doing it. What does it mean? Turn to Psalm chapter 35 and look at verse number 13. Psalm 35 and verse number 13. And there's a ton of verses on fasting, and we're not going to be able to get to them all um, either, but I, I'll be able to get the point across at least. But the Bible says in Psalm 35, 13, But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled my soul with fasting. Just, that's it right there. Okay? That is the main point of fasting right there. And it goes along with the clothing that you see everyone having, you know, when they're fasting. It says, I humbled my soul with fasting, and my prayer returned into mine own bosom. So fasting, we see here in Psalm 35, is to humble yourself before God. And fasting, so you're using it to humble yourself before God. It's the same thing as the clothing. So sackcloth. So everyone's in sackcloth and they put ashes on their head, but they basically wear sackcloth. What's that? It's like a potato sack. Think of, uh, you know, you're, you're basically taking off your nice clothing, things that maybe might make you feel proud. You know, when I put a suit on and I, you know, it, it's, you kind of feel like, okay, I'm ready to go somewhere and you know, you could feel like you're somebody and all this, but you're to humble yourself before God. You put a potato sack on, and you're like, I'm nobody. You're humbled, okay? Turn to Nehemiah chapter 1. And the, the, the main thing here, so we see with the sackcloth and the fasting, it's to humble your soul, to humble yourself before God. And then it goes hand in hand with prayer. Whenever you see somebody in the Bible, or most times you see somebody in the Bible, that is fasting, they are either praying or they are getting ready to pray. They're getting ready to go to God with something. They're getting ready to, you know, bring something before the Lord. Okay, there's a couple exceptions. I'll bring up one of them a little bit later. Turn to Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah chapter 1. And look at verse number 4. So Nehemiah fasted. He fasted. Look at uh, verse number 4. It says, And it came to pass when I heard these words. So Nehemiah, he heard the state of Jerusalem. He heard that all the walls were torn down and they were burned and that everything was terrible and it was not a good situation. And he wanted to do something about it. 
He wanted to do something about it. It came to pass when I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Again, it goes with prayer. Turn to Psalm chapter 69. Turn to Psalm chapter 69. Look, something was wrong and something was really wrong most of the time that you see people fasting. I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's a very serious situation and somebody needs to approach God. Somebody needs to come and ask God something through prayer. That's when you'll see fasting come in most of the time in the Bible. Look at Psalm 69 and verse number 10. The Bible says in Psalm 69, verse number 10, when I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that was to, to bring low your soul. Once again, same thing, humbling. That was to my reproach. I made sackcloth, there's sackcloth again, also my garment, and I became a proverb to them. That they, sit in the, they, they that sit in the gate speak against me, and I was the song of the drunkards. But as for me, my prayer, there it is again, is unto thee, O Lord, in an acceptable time, O God, in the multitude of thy mercy, hear me in the truth of thy salvation. So fasting is a way to show humility when you come to, it, to God in a time of prayer so God will hear you, so God will answer you in a positive way. It's a way to show, look, it's a way to show your willingness to sacrifice the desires of the flesh. It's a demonstration, so to speak, of, of your willingness to be obedient. So you say, I mean, so you say, why, why fasting? Why that one thing? There's a lot of things, you know, in the flesh. Well, first of all, you know, turn, I mean, just, uh, I, I don't really have this. Um, turn to, um, why fasting? Research shows that hunger is one of the most powerful, one of the most powerful urges that your flesh will ever have. Turn to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. So, I mean, it shows, it's one of the most powerful human desires, this desire of this, this feeling of hunger. Studies have been done in animals that show animals will risk anything in order to, you know, in order to gain food when they're hungry. Okay, but, you know, Jesus fasted too. Did you know that? And Jesus fasted for an interesting reason. Look at Matthew chapter 4. Right before, right after his baptism and before Jesus was getting ready to go recruit everybody to go um, on, on, his, uh, on, his, um, on his, uh, his mission to go and, and begin his ministry, um, Jesus, in, in Matthew chapter 4, look at verse number 1. It says, Then Jesus led up the Spirit, led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. This goes to show you the temptation that that feeling of hunger is. The Bible says that Jesus went and he fasted 40 days and 40 nights. And in Luke chapter 4, look, I, I don't believe this was a supernatural event when Jesus went and fasted. I believe that he actually went and fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Luke gets more specific and says he ate nothing for 40 days. You can go 40 days if you are a healthy individual without eating, you can't go without drinking anything. That's why it said he ate nothing. I believe that this was not a supernatural event. This was a, that Jesus the man put his body, his flesh through this. Why? To be tempted of the devil. Because Hebrews chapter 4 says that he was, that, that like as us, he was tempted in all things, yet without sin. So he went to be tempted of the devil to show that in an extreme case, before he began his ministry, in a very extreme case, that he could still go without sin. He could still go without sin. So all that just to say that hunger is an extreme, extreme feeling. Turn to 2 Kings chapter 6. I mean, the Bible even tells us stories, and I'm sure we've heard many stories you know, throughout history of horrible situations that demonstrate the same thing that I'm going to show you in 2 Kings chapter 6. But people will literally commit murder over hunger. 2 Kings chapter 6. Look at verse number 26. The Bible says, And as the king of Israel was passing by upon the wall, there cried a woman unto him, saying, Help, my lord, O king. And he said, If the lord do not help me, when shall I help thee? Out of the barn floor or out of the wine press? Look, they, they, were, they were in a famine. They had no, nothing to eat. And the king said unto her, What aileth thee? And she answered, This woman said unto me, Give thy son that we may eat him today, and we'll eat my son tomorrow. 
So here, here are these two ladies. They made a deal, and this lady came up to this other lady and said, let's eat your son today, and then when we're done eating your son, because we have nothing to eat, we'll eat my son. I mean, they're talking about eating their own children. Look, this is literal here. So we boiled my son and did eat him, and I said unto her on the next day, give thy son that we may eat him, and she hid her own son. So this lady, she didn't, you know, she backed out of the bargain. She's like, we ate, you know, we ate your son. And so, I mean, she's coming to the king. Imagine the situation. She's coming to the king like, look at this horrible injustice this woman did to us. And the king's like, they're eating their children, is what the king. And it came to pass, the king heard these words of the woman. He rent his clothes, and he passed upon the wall, and the people looked, and behold, he had sackcloth within upon his flesh. And he was already fasting, because I'm sure they were all starving. Look, people will literally murder over food if they get hungry enough. So fasting, fasting, denying this powerful urge to yourself is a humbling situation. It's humbling and it's designed to show God in times of prayer that you are willing to deny your flesh for Him. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. It's a good thing to do to just to show God that, you know what, I'm, I'm willing, this is how serious I am, I'm, I'm willing to be obedient, I'm willing to deny myself, to humble myself. I mean, the Lord loves the humble, He hates the proud. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, look at verse 27. You're willing to deny your flesh before you come to the Lord in prayer. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, look at verse 27. The Bible says, But I keep under my body, and bring it into subjection lest that by any means, when I have preached unto others, I myself should be a castaway. Paul here is talking about the denial of his flesh as a method to keep himself close to God. Okay, he's talking about, you know, having self-control. You know, fasting is a demonstration of this. It's a demonstration of your self-control to God. So look, it's a sign of humility and obedience. We see that. It's an outward demonstration. Turn to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Go back to Matthew chapter 6. It's an outward demonstration of obedience and humility to God. But it is not to be, and here's the trick, and here's kind of the whole point, or, or one of the main themes of Matthew chapter 6 that we just read, it is not to be an outward demonstration to man. And that's what Jesus was, was ripping on in Matthew chapter 6. Look at verse number 16. Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you that they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret. And thy father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. So, what are we doing? We're praying, right? We're praying and we're asking God for something, right? When we're praying and we're in these extreme situations, Nehemiah, Esther, uh, Jehoshaphat, you name it, people in the Bible, David, that fasted and prayed in sackcloth, they're asking God for something in a time of emergency, especially in these cases. And look, they're asking for God to reward them with a positive answer here. And God is saying, this is this fasting, you're supposed to do it in a way that, that you're not doing it to be spiritual to other people. You're not supposed to come to church and be like, you know, maybe, look, fasting is something that people in the Old Testament, New Testament, it's available to you, you should do it. You should spiritually fast. If you have something that is heavy on your heart, a big decision in your life, you should fast. But I'm not going to come and tell you that, uh, you know, I've got this big decision in my life and I'm fasting right now. Like when I was telling you I was fasting, that's just, that's fasting for health reasons and things like that. When I fast spiritually, that's between me and God. I am not supposed to come to church and be like, listen, uh, I got this big thing going on and I'm just, uh, I'm just, I've been fasting for four days. And, you know, you come to church and you're like, ah. Uh, you know, you're like, everybody's like, what's wrong, brother? Oh, nothing, I'm fasting. And, you know, I'm super spiritual, you know? And, you know, it's, it's an outward demonstration to men at that point, and God says at that point, good enough. Uh, you know, you've got your reward. Because as I come to church, 
and I'm up here and I can hardly preach because I'm just like, I'm so much more spiritual than all of you because I've been fasting for five days. You know, that's my reward. Because when you all think I'm awesome because of that, you won't. But when you all think that that's great, God's just saying, you know, that's your reward right there. Your reward is that, you know, you went and bragged on how great and spiritual you were. That goes for anything, by the way. People that are trying to out-spiritualize everybody else, I mean, look, there's your reward right there. Okay? I mean, that's the whole thing. Uh, the, the Part of the theme of the beginning of Matthew chapter 6 was just doing all these outward things to be, look at how spiritual I am. But the Bible is saying that we have this, it's something that we should use, but keep it between you and God. Keep it between you and God. It, it, it's, that's what spiritual fasting, not you and everyone around you. I mean, exam there's a lot of examples of this today. Lent, you know, when I was a Lutheran and Catholics, the same thing. You know, it's everybody, what did you give up for Lent? You know, and everyone's just talking about what they gave up for Lent. And no one ever really gave it up anyway that I ever knew. I'm sure some people do. But it was just all about telling people what you gave up for Lent. You know, or the, oh, man, I used to work with this Jewish guy. And this Jewish guy, so, you know, you know as, a, as a Jew, he became a religious Jew, and he can't eat bacon. And every single time we went to, my wife is laughing because she knows, every single time we'd go to dinner, anywhere, at any company event, anything, whatever, this guy was just like, is there bacon in this? You know, because, you know, I can't have bacon. He just had to announce to everybody at the table that he can't eat bacon. He asked one time if there was bacon in mashed potatoes. And I'm like, man, who puts bacon? I said this. I was like, who puts bacon in mashed potatoes? You know? Ash Wednesday, you know, everyone walking around with the cross on their forehead. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. You have your reward. You're doing things to be seen of men. God's not interested in that. God here is giving you some tools. He's giving you some tools. Look, prayer's a tool that we have. We can go in a closet and we can meet with God. We, we, we only have one mediator, Jesus Christ. We can go and we can just meet with Jesus anytime we want. That's a tool. This is like a, this is like a bolt on, you know, extension of the tool, is what it is. It's like a, it's like a lever, you know, on the wrench. Think of it that way. But it's between you and God. Nobody else. Turn to Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58. And it matters. It matters. If you do it for the wrong reasons or you do it to be seen of men, it's of no effect. It's of no benefit to you. So why would you do that? Isaiah chapter 58, look at verse number 3. People fasting for the wrong reasons. You can see this in the Bible as well. Isaiah chapter 58, look at verse number 3. The Bible says, Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge? Behold, in the day of your fast ye find pleasure, and exact all your labors. Behold, ye fast for strife and debate, and to smite with the fist of wickedness. Ye shall not fast as ye do this day, to make your voice to be heard on high. Is it such a fast that I have chosen, a day for man to afflict his, his soul? That's, he's saying that's what it's for. To afflict your soul. Is it a, to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth? Is it, is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this a fast, an acceptable day to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I have chosen, to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, that ye break every yoke? Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and to the bring the poor that are to cast out to thy house? When thou seest the naked, thou cover him. When thou hidest not thyself from thine own flesh. These people are fasting for the wrong reasons here. They're doing it the wrong way. You know, in the day of their flat, fast, they, they find pleasure. And, 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 and they're exacting all their labors. They're not, they're not fasting for the Lord. They're fasting for the wrong reasons with the wrong heart. So your motives matter. And the Bible says in Matthew chapter 6, these people, they have their reward. They have their reward. So... You know, in conclusion, you know, tonight, you know, fasting is biblical. It's something that we should do. It's something that, it's a tool that you should use in your life. So you say, how do I do it? How do I fast? Well, I mean, you know, it's, let me just give you some examples of, of spiritual um, fasts. Uh, turn to Daniel chapter 10. I mean, first of all, you could just not eat for 24 hours. That, that's, a, that's a decent fast. 
not eating anything for 24 hours. If you're not used to doing that, that will be a challenge for you. It will be a sacrifice for you to do that, to not eat anything for 24 hours. 48 hours, it, it can be done, okay? I mean, so you can, I mean, but when you, when you set a fast to yourself, keep it private and, and follow through on it. You know, I mean, it's, I mean, think about it. You're trying to show your, I mean, just think about the silliness of this for a second, okay? You're trying to, and my wife and I kind of, you know, she, she knows when I'm fasting and I know when she's fasting, obviously not to, to uh, you know, impress each other or whatever, but because we're living together, you know? And, you know, she's cooking the meals and, and I'm seeing her and I'm like, let's go to dinner. And she's like, I can't. I'm like, oh, man. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know? But, I mean, you know, the point is, is that, it, it, it's, a, it's a challenge. It, it can be a challenge to, to fast. But just think of the silliness of declaring, okay, I'm, I'm praying about something. I, I have a, a bad situation in my life or I have a big decision coming up. That's another good one. I have a big decision. I don't want to make the wrong decision. Okay, I need God's help on this. So I'm going to fast. I'm going to fast for 48 hours. I'm not going to eat anything for 48 hours. I'm going to drink. Um, water, but I'm going to do that. And then you're just like, you get like hour 12 and you're like, man, I need an a, a in and out double-double right now. And you just go have it. Okay, think of, the, think of the silliness of that. You basically told God that you're going to show Him that you're going to be obedient and you're going to come to Him with a request. You're going to come to Him with a request. And then you're just going to just back out of everything you know, uh, of your side of the bargain that you made in that case. It, it, it doesn't make any sense. You would be better off not doing it. You would be better off not doing it. In Daniel chapter 10, Daniel did a partial food fast. Okay, look at Daniel chapter 10. So you could just not eat anything for a day. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a decent fast. Daniel chapter 10, look at verse number 2. The Bible says, In those days I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. And I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all, till three whole weeks were fulfilled. So Daniel just, he put off in this case, he put off, you know, good food. He put off the, the king's type food, the meat, whatever. Something, it was a sacrifice for him. And he did it, he did that sacrifice for three weeks. But look, the bottom line is, you know, make the commitment and follow through on it. It is the key with fasting. Okay, turn to Esther chapter 4. Here's another one. It's just a complete fast. Like, eat or drink nothing. Eat or drink nothing. Now, you make your own you know, decisions on, on these things, but what I'm telling you is, you know, follow through on the fast that you decide to take. Esther chapter 4. She was going to go and she was going to approach the king. Esther was going to risk her life for the people. Okay, so she was going to go, and she was asking people to pray for her. She's like, hey, pray for me, you know, go to God for me, that I may, you know, be successful in this case, that the king may not kill me. Look at uh, verse number 16. And she says this, she says, go gather all the Jews that are present in Shushan, and fast ye for me, and neither, <coughs> excuse me, neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise, and so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law, and if I perish, I perish. Of course, this famous verse there. But she's saying, she's saying, have all the people eat or drink nothing for three days. Now, that, look, that, that's an extreme one. Okay, that's an extreme one. Paul took the same one in Acts chapter 9 when Paul was blinded, and the Bible says he ate or drank nothing for three days. I mean, I mean imagine... I mean, he's beseeching God. I mean, he just, he just met Jesus on the side of the road, and Jesus blinded him, and, you know, he ate or drank nothing for three days. Look, Paul knew what a fast was. He was a religious Jew. Now, I mean, eating, eating or drinking nothing for three days is extreme. You ever heard of the rule of three? The rule of three? Like, have you ever, you know, read a survival book or something? You know, the rule of three is this. You can go, you know, what is it? You can go three minutes without air. You can go three days without food, and you can go three weeks uh, without water. No, I'm sorry, you can go three days without water, and you can go three weeks without food. But, I mean, 
you know, and you could go longer than three weeks. Obviously, Jesus went 40 days, 40 nights, which is possible. But I mean, that's a general rule of thumb. So three days, as Esther did, without eating or drinking anything, that, you know, that's extreme. Okay? I wouldn't necessarily recommend that one. But the point is, you know, choose a fast. There's lots of different types of fast. Choose something that is a sacrifice to you and follow through on it. Here's another thing you can do. Here's another thing you can do. You can fast. Look, you can fast from other things. There's, there's the Bible talks about in Exodus chapter 19, the Bible talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, of fasting from, you know, fasting from a relationship with your spouse. You know, the Bible, you know, talks about, you know, with consent, by the way. You know, with consent for a time. All right? But it just, it just means what the point is the same is that you are denying the flesh for a certain period of time to humble yourself and to approach God for a request. That's what you're doing. Okay? So, look, let me just tie it all together here. You know, we started out with some biblical advice on food, um, you know, but, and then we talked about the reasons for spiritual fasting, how you could spiritually fast. It's something, look, it's something I, we don't talk about it a lot. And, you know, I, I don't know if, if, if you all fast or you don't, but look, you should. And, and if you're praying, and especially if you're praying for something important or, you know, something coming up, you should fast. You know, you should proclaim a fast to God. It's, it's available to you, okay? It's very, very biblical. It's very biblical. But look, the, here's an interesting thing that I just want to close with this evening. The rules and the concepts in the Bible, as with, look, they are almost, they are always, if it's a command in the Bible, you say, okay, these are commands in the Bible, they're always good for us. They're always good for us. Fasting is a powerful spiritual tool that we can use, but it's a way to humble ourselves before God. It's an outward demonstration to God. It, you know, and it should be done you know, with humility between you and God. But look, as with all other things, just think about fornication and drunkenness and just sin in general, if you follow God's commands on these things, it's literally good for you physically. I mean, that's the, the beauty of, of the, the body. And, and you know, this is becoming kind of a, a, a trendy thing, like this intermittent fasting. You know, you're starting to be the new trendy type of diets. You're starting to see it. Turn to Proverbs chapter 23. But there's a lot of health benefits to, you know, intermittent fasting, which is basically what, you know, fasting in the Bible is about. It's not like you fast forever. Look at Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 21. The Bible says, For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty. And, this is really interesting, And drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. So the Bible here is comparing somebody who's a glutton. Because look, science will tell you the same thing. That somebody who's a glutton, you know what they're going to do? They're going to be tired all the time. You know what happens when you eat too much? You get tired. I mean, don't you have that? I mean, you eat a bunch of turkey at Thanksgiving and you eat way too much food and everyone just takes a nap afterwards. Everyone falls asleep. You know what happens when you fast? You know what happens when you stop eating too much? You gain energy. You gain energy. I told my wife when I started doing like that intermittent fasting, and I started, I mean, it's like I just felt like a different person. I mean, it was crazy. I mean, it was a, you don't see a lot. Of, I mean, I, you know, we take vitamins and we do all these things, but I, I haven't done too many things in my life that have made such a big difference as that. It just, it was a super big change. But look, even, um, I, I looked up health.com. Here's some, here's some scientific things that just eating less intermittent fasting will do for you. Blood sugar control. It'll boost your immune system. I mean, hello. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, blood pressure. It, it'll fix blood pressure problems. Heart health. Heart disease kills, I, I don't know, everybody. I mean, heart disease is a huge problem in the United States. It improves brain function. I'm still waiting for that one. It boosts metabolism. Like, it, it just makes everything better. So not only are you eating less, but your metabolism gets, gets higher. That's why you, you lose weight so fast. And then, here's a really, I, I've solved a huge mystery here. I've solved a huge mystery. Look, it increases HGH and testosterone like 5X after two days. You start inter intermittent fasting, and 
Testosterone and HGH, human growth hormone, increase, especially in men, after two days. I mean, this is the main reason, I'm convinced of it, that men have less testosterone than they did. You know, have you ever heard the, you know, read the article, you are half the man that your grandpa was? I mean, literally, testosterone is dropping like 1% in men in the United States every single year. It's ridiculously scary. It, it's just, it's because we don't exercise and we eat garbage. <laughs> That's what it is. Mystery solved. But look, this is, I mean, this is the reason that, you know, it, it slows aging, it prevents cancer, there's a whole slew of other things. But I, I made up one on my own, okay? I mean, I mean, I felt so much better. I'm going to continue doing it as long as, you know, as long as I can. But look, here's the thing. Maybe God who designed this thing, this body that we're living in, was actually onto something. When he gave us all this advice on how to eat, when to eat, what to eat, you know, how much sugar to eat, you know, you know what a lot of people in 2020 died from? Not to get into it, but they died from a lifetime of gluttony is what they died from. You know, mankind, I mean, I mean, just think of the, mankind thinks that we can just go through this life and do whatever we want for decades and there's going to be no consequences. I mean, it's, you know, we can live however we want, we can deny ourselves nothing. Whatever I feel at the moment, I'm going to have. That, that's, that's where we're at in this country. And there will be no consequences to anything. That, look, that's never going to be true. No matter how people think, you know, it should be true, that is never going to be true, ever. But let me add number, you know, the, well, let me add one more at the end of the list. It is good for us. It is good for us in general to learn to deny the flesh. That is good. Let's say you pray, you pray every day, but, you know, every two weeks, you have something that you have, you know, you, uh, it, it's, it's real serious. Or it's a bigger concern. You know, if, if you put in fasting into your, you know, more serious prayers or however you want to implement it in your life, look, that's going to be good for you. That's going to be good for you spiritually. That's going to be good for your relationship with the Lord. And look, that is going to be good for you physically, and it's going to be good for you spiritually in the sense that it will give you training in denying the flesh. That's going to give you all kinds of training to deny the flesh. Because look, what did Jesus choose? What did Jesus choose to be tempted of the devil? He chose hunger. Why did, because it's such a powerful feeling. It's such a powerful fleshly desire. If you can learn to control that one, I think you got a chance at controlling sin in your life. You're going to deal with this flesh your whole life on this earth. As long as you're living on this earth, you're going to have temptations and these fleshly desires. You might as well get good at controlling it. And this is a good way to do it. It's a good way to do it. it just, it's, it's such a, a, a great example of how things in the Bible, things that God puts in place for us, are just, they have so many other benefits that we don't even think about. So, I mean, fasting. It's, a, it's, a, it's an outward denial of the flesh. It humbles us before God when we come to God in prayer. But look, it's a good thing to do in your life in general, and it will just give you so many benefits in your life. All right? Let's have some cake. Let's pray.